start the recording. Yeah, just did. Okay. Uh, good op good morning, everyone. Welcome to the QSOF seminar today. Uh, we have Simon Nappers. He is a postdoc jointly position in India and CWI. Uh, without any further ado, Simon, uh, floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Um, good. So good morning, uh, everyone. I hope all of you are doing well. Um, I'm going to talk about joint work with Andras Gillian and Stacy Jeffrey. Um, we have a work which has a title, A Unified Framework of Quantum Walk Search. Um, throughout the talk, please feel um, very free to interrupt me at any point. Like, um, I mean, I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised like, if there's sound issues or whatever, um, or maybe if there's something, something that you wanna ask, okay? Um, so I'll start off by um, this uh, small drawing of a graph. Right, and so throughout this talk, um, we'll mainly be thinking about graphs G, uh, which have node set V and edge set E, right? Uh, so these dots here are nodes, like some node X and V, and that this would be an edge, and an edge is just a pair of nodes, okay? Uh, we'll be thinking about undirected graphs and unweighted graphs. Um, the, like in our original work, the graphs are weighted and everything and uh, things are more general, but for the purpose of this talk, I'll just assume that the graphs are unweighted. What I'm also gonna assume is that the graphs are regular, even though I realize that this particular graph that I'm showing is not regular, but um, nevertheless, for the purpose of this talk, you can think about all graphs being regular, meaning that all nodes have an equal number of neighbors, all right? Um, somewhat more specifically, we're going to be interested in what we call um, random walks, right? So a random walk on uh, a graph G looks somewhat like this. Like we take some, we pick some initial node S, we call this X here, like the initial state of the mark of, of the random walk, right? And then we pick a uniformly random neighbor, let's say this one, we move to that one, right? So this becomes X1. We again pick a uniformly random neighbor, could be this one, we get x2, and so on, right? You get the picture. Um, so a random walk looks somewhat like this, like we have some initial state and we move to another state, move to another state, and so on, where the states are basically um, the nodes of our graph, all right? Now, given these things, a uh, sort of natural question to ask is, if you have some starting point S and uh, we have a set of marked elements, right? I'll typically denote this by the set M, um, what is the time for a random walk from this initial state to hit a set M, right? So again, we'll have some walk that moves around the graph somewhat like this and so on. And at some point it's gonna move into this set, right? And so what would be the time for, for this walk to hit that set M? Um, this is a random uh, variable, right? Because a random walk um, is basically a random process. Um, so somewhat more specifically, we'll be interested in the expected time for a random walk starting from, let's say, S to hit a set M. And this thing uh, is what we call the hitting time. All right. Um, so the hitting time HT from S to a set M. All right. So this is a bit of a mathematical uh, concept, um, but why would, we, wh wh why would we be interested in such a thing? Um, so on one hand, um, this provides us with uh, great maths. Um, so random walks, hitting times, and similar concepts are a very natural way to study graphs and electric networks. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they provide us with great algorithms. Um, so I guess nobody will be surprised that random walks and, and such things um, are very important primitives for a lot of graph algorithms. Uh, for example, like the graph algorithm, um, uh, where we wanna solve uh, where two nodes S and T are connected, um, so there's a log space algorithm for that, which, which basically uses random walks and hitting times and so on. Okay. Now, the second thing that, that um, I'm gonna be talking about, which should come even less as a surprise, uh, are um, quantum walks, okay? So quantum walks are the sort of quantum mechanical counterpart of random walks. And so instead of um, going from node to node, we'll be basically be moving from superposition over the nodes to superposition over the nodes. 
So let's say we start from some initial state S, which would be psi zero. Then after a single step, um, we basically get a sort of superposition over um, uh, neighbors of this node, right? So let's say that, you know, our wall kind of moves that way, right? So then we would have um, a state psi one here and so on. And this, this kind of superposition moves throughout the graph. Um, so basically quantum walk does the following thing, starting from um, some initial node S, which is our, which, which is our initial state. This moves to some state psi one after a single quantum walk step to state psi two and so on. And there's some issues with exactly defining these things, but again, for the purpose of this talk, it just suffices to think about these um, quantum states here as superpositions over the elements, over the nodes of the graph, okay? Um, and similar to random walks, typically we also assume that um, basically a random walk can only move to a neighbor. I would also assume that um, a quantum state can only move uh, um, amplitude to sort of neighboring states, right? So from one state can only move uh, amplitude to neighboring states. Now we can ask the same question. Let's say that we have some quantum walk starting from uh, initial node S and we have a marked set of elements. What is the time for a quantum walk um, from S to hit the set M, right? And so I'm putting hit between quotes here because what does it even mean for a quantum state to hit a set M, right? Like I said, um, quantum state at some point is not uh, localized on a node necessarily. Um, so, as, so, so in contrast to, to the random walk, it's not clear when um, a quantum walk has hit a set M. And again, for the purpose of this talk, it will suffice to just think about um, um, a quantum state which has sort of significant overlap with the marked set M. That would be the point where we say that a quantum walk um, has hit M, right? So at some point we'll have, we, we might have a state Psi T which has a significant overlap with M and that's when we say that the quantum walk has hit this set, all right? So similar to, to random walks, um, studying quantum walks and, and their hitting times and, and similar quantities um, um, are interesting for different reasons. Right, on the one hand, they again provide us with great maths. Um, quantum walks and their spectral characterization um, are a very natural application of uh, Jordan's lemma, which is an old lemma from 1875. Um, and there's a very close and, and, and very elegant relation to electric network theory, which is basically a, a classical thing, right? Uh, but as Balov showed in 13 and, and, and Pidok further explored in 19, uh, there's really a very close relationship between these two things. On the other hand, let me just, on the other hand, uh, they also provide us with uh, great quantum algorithms. Uh, so why is that? Um, the main reason is that uh, quantum walks can speed up the hitting time of random walks. Uh, and this led to speed ups for um, element distinctness as Ambaini showed in 03. Um, a more recent example is uh, Ashley Montanaro who showed in 15 how um, quantum walks and quantum hitting times allow to speed up backtracking algorithms. And there's really like a whole range of other examples. So that being said, um, it seems quite natural to you know, study these things and, and, and kind of delve out what exactly is the relation between these random walks and hitting times and quantum walks and hitting times. And this has been quite a sort of interesting journey, uh, which, which, which also uh, is, is still ongoing. Um, to maybe formalize things a little bit, um, we consider two tasks. On the one hand, um, we consider um, the task of using a random walk starting from, so I'm going to generalize a little bit. Before I said that X0 would be some initial node, but now I'm going to assume that X0 is some um, uh, distribution, right? So sigma is a distribution and we pick an initial node according to distrib this distribution, right? Let's say that sigma is localized here and we run a random walk from there, right? So we pick some initial node, X0, and then we run um, a random walk, which might move throughout the graph. And at some point we're going to hit the set M, right? And so we want to find an element in M uh, using this random walk from X zero. On the other hand, in the quantum domain, we have a quantum walk uh, starting now from uh, the quantum state Psi zero, uh, which I'm also going to generalize. So um, with every pr classical probability distribution, we can kind of canonically associate a, a, quantum, uh, a quantum state, which I'll denote by a uh, cat sigma, which is basically defined as um, square root sigma x 
x, right? So it's the superposition over the nodes. And if we were to measure the state, then we would get x with probability sigma x. So basically then we would get this, the, the, the classical state. Um, but we start from the quantum state, okay? And now starting from this quantum state, um, we wanna uh, use quantum walks to move throughout the graph and at some point end up with um, a quantum state psi t, which has significant overlap Society, which has significant overlap with M, right? So that basically hits M. Uh, and effectively we wanna find, ultimately we wanna find an element in M, okay? Now, uh, while doing so, we wanna um, minimize certain costs associated to these schemes. Um, so where are these costs? Uh, we will have a um, setup cost, an update cost, and a checking cost, which I define um, as follows. So the setup cost basically corresponds to creating this initial sample. So classically, this corresponds to um, sampling the initial node x0 according to this distribution sigma. In the quantum domain, this corresponds to creating the quantum state sigma, all right? So this is kind of like, like the setup cost um, of our algorithm. Then we have this update cost, which is basically the cost of implementing a random walk or quantum walk, right? So in the classical, Case, in the random walk case, this corresponds to sampling. If we're at, at some point at some node X, we wanna sample a node Y, um, uniformly random from the neighborhood of node X. In the quantum case, uh, we wanna basically implement the map from the state X to um, a superposition, right? So D is a degree, the, the number of neighbors and the superposition over all the neighbors of X, right? Uh, so I'm gonna be a bit loose in, in exactly defining these things. So, so what we actually need, we also need to be able to um, implement the reverse of this map and so on, but I'm gonna allow myself to not um, go into too many details there. And finally, uh, we have this checking cost C, which corresponds to classically answering the question, is some node Z marked? So is Z in M? And in the quantum case, uh, and again, I'm gonna be a bit loose here uh, um, about the exact sort of axis that we have, uh, but, but, but you can think about um, that we should be able to reflect around the marked element. So basically, if Z is marked, then, then, then we, 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 um, we get a minus sign in front, whereas if it's not marked, um, it's, it, it stays just like that, all right? So these are kind of dual pictures that we have. Um, and the goal is to kind of compare random walk algorithms and quantum walk algorithms using these costs. Okay. So I'll start off by classically saying what we can do. So classically, the straightforward thing to do is what we call a hitting time algorithm. Um, and, and, and it goes as follows. Uh, we use the setup cost to create our initial um, state x0 right, and x here is distributed according to sigma, right, so basically we get a, some initial state x zero here. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna update the state, which means implementing single random walk steps, so, so basically picking a random neighbor, and we're gonna check whether this new state is marked or not, right, and then we get x1, then we do the same thing, we update the state and we check, we get x2 and so on, until at some point um, we find xt in m, all right? So basically this looks like this, right? We, we, we take a step we, and we check, take a step and we check and so on. Until at some point we check and we find that indeed um, we found a marked element. So this is kind of the straightforward thing to do, right? Um, and the cost of this scheme can be determined by noting that the number of, of steps here basically corresponds to the number of, of, of random walk steps that we need to hit the set M. Um, this will be, at least in expectation, this will be equal to the hitting time from sigma to M, all right? So that means that the cost, the total cost will be S, like we implement the setup cost once, plus um, the number of steps here, and every step has cost U plus C, and we expect to do approximately ht of them, hitting time of them, okay? Now, while this seems like the straightforward thing to do, there's also a second kind of algorithm, which is, which is slightly different 
um, and, and, um, and, and also interesting, uh, which we'll call a mixing time algorithm, right? So for this mixing time algorithm, I have to define two things. One is uh, what we call the spectral gap. And so again, I'm going to be a little bit fake here. So uh, the spectral gap is uh, a non-negative scalar, uh, which corresponds to, um, so mathematically it corresponds to the spectral gap of the random walk transition uh, operator. But we're going to define it as the scalar such that the following holds, starting from any initial state X, if we take one over delta steps, right? So this is the update, this corresponds to a step. And we take one over delta steps, then the endpoint should be approximately distributed according to the random walk stationary distribution, right? So any random walk on a sort of a, pro, like a sort of well-defined or, or well-behaved graph um, converges to a stationary distribution. Um, again, for the purpose of this talk, you can just think about um, the spice being the uniform distribution, right? So for a regular graph, you get, if the graph is connected, that a random walk will converge to this uniform distribution. Right? So basically this illustrates this thing where if you start from any X, if you walk for long enough and you look at the end node, then this end node is gonna be distributed according to the stationary distribution. All right, so that's how we define the spectral gap as basically the length of this path. And second, we define a parameter epsilon, which is basically the probability that um, we get a marked element given that uh, we take a sample from the stationary distribution or the uniform distribution. All right, so basically this equals the probability that like if we take a uniformly random node that is going to be marked. Um, so this equals the size of M over the number of nodes, which is the size of V. All right, um, so we define these two things and then I'll just make a small claim here, which I'm not going to prove, um, but it's kind of useful to compare things, which is uh, that one over epsilon, now this quantity basically measures how many uniformly random samples we would need in order to get a, um, get a marked element. The hitting time will be at least that. So this kind of expresses that the hitting time is number of random walk steps, right? So, so basically things can be a bit more inefficient by taking these random walks versus really taking uniformly random samples. Um, but it's at most one over epsilon delta. So basically you get that if one over delta is small, so the spectral gap is large, then you get that um, a random walk very fast converges to the spy and basically it, it behaves almost like we're taking uniform independent samples. Um, and by kind of making these things a bit more, I mean, the claims that I'm making a bit more rigorous, you can prove this claim. Um, so given this, uh, these definitions, uh, we can now define what we call a mixing time algorithm. Um, which goes as follows. Like again, we set up by picking some initial uh, X zero, which will be distributed according to Sigma, right? So we have some X zero here. And then what we do is instead of um, applying a single random walk step and checking, we're gonna apply many of them. And then we're gonna apply one over Delta of them. This will basically ensure that the end node here of this walk, right? We have X zero here and now we take a long walk we get an X1, that this X1 will basically be distributed according to pi, right? Because that's basically by definition of, of, of this delta parameter. And then we check, right? Is this node marked or not? If it's not, we go on. Like we again um, take one of our delta steps and we check X2 and so on until in the end we get uh, some XT in M, all right? So we, we take a long walk. And in the end, we'll find some marked node. Now note that um, after this first step, basically all these guys are independent samples, um, IID samples from this uniform stationary distribution. So how many, how many of those samples do we need? We need one over epsilon of them, right? Because epsilon is the probability that a single sample will get a marked element. So what do we get here? We get different cost. The cost here is again S, plus basically one over epsilon times this operation. So combining these things, we get the following cost. One over epsilon delta times u plus one over epsilon times c. All right. And now we can kind of compare this with, with, with the um, algorithm that we described before. 
which was this um, hitting time algorithm, which had a cost S plus, um, sorry, plus hitting time U plus hitting time C, right? Which correspond to basically taking a single step and checking every time. And now we see that these, these two algorithms are basically incomparable, right? Because by the claim that I just made in, in the previous slide, uh, we know that the hitting time was, is at most this quantity. So basically the update cost will be larger in this scheme but the checking cost will be smaller. And so these two schemes kind of incorporate the fact that um, an update of the random walk and a check of whether an item is marked or not can be very different costs. And, and, and the one can be larger than the other depending on the situation. And so you can kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, pick here which algorithm would be better suited for uh, your purpose, all right? So these are basically the two sort of classical pictures that we have. Um, the two costs are displayed here uh, on the bottom of this slide. Uh, so now let's see what, uh, what quantum walks have to offer, All right? So we're gonna look at quantum walk algorithms and quantum walk uh, hitting time algorithms, uh, which you can basically think of as being al algorithms that implement Grover on graphs. So I'm kind of limiting the scope here a little um, because this statement is not true in general, right? There's quantum walk algorithms on graphs algorithms on, on graphs that, that give exponential speedups. Uh, these are kind of very particular um, and, and, and this is basically not what, what, what we're talking about in this paper. What we're talking about in this paper is, is basically quantum walk algorithms, algorithms that give a sort of Grover-ish speedup on, on uh, graph search problems. So for perspective, um, in 96, we had uh, Grover search and then in 03 and 04, we, we got this uh, sort of quantum walk search speedup or, or hitting time speedup for a range of graphs going from lattices to Johnson graphs to hypercubes and so on. But um, the analysis of, of, of the quantum walk algorithms were kind of ad hoc, right? So you had a bit of an ad hoc analysis um, to prove speedups on these graphs. And that's why these graphs, um, why we particularly could expect this sort of set of graphs because these are very symmetric graphs um, and, and they would typically allow to, you know, explicitly diagonalize a quantum walk operator and so on. Um, so basically it was only um, starting from the work in, of Segeti in, in 04 and onward that, that we could talk about quantum walk speeders for general graphs, right? So not for these sort of specific symmetric graphs, but really for arbitrary graphs. Um, like I said, this started by the work, um, this, was, this was started by the work of Segedi in 04. So what did Segedi prove? Um, so I'm gonna sort of prepare you. There's basically two slides here of, of kind of, you know, a timeline, um, but they all, all offer sort of, you know, comparable, um, comparable um, uh, results. So what Segedi proved in 04 was that if um, the initial distribution sigma is the uniform one, so it's sort of a, a particular case. Um, then we can detect whether there exists a marked element or not. And now this is kind of a peculiar thing that 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 that, um, that showed up in this uh, quantum walk um, um, hitting times literature is that. In contrast to classical algorithms and quantum algorithms, it seemed that sometimes you could detect where there was a marked element or not, but not actually find a marked element, right? So this is kind of a weaker thing, right? So classically, you necessarily have to find one to, to detect one, but here it, it seems that we could also detect it without finding one. Um, so ultimately we would of course like to find this thing, right? So that's why I'm putting these, both these, these things here in red because they're kind of constraints on this framework. Right, we have to constrain the initial distribution to be the uniform one, and uh, we only detect whether there's a marked element or not. But he got a very nice uh, expression for the cost of, 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 of this algorithm, which is basically the setup cost plus square root of the hitting time, u plus c, right? So you can compare this with the classical costs. So, so if for a second, we, we kind of assume that the classical and quantum versions of these costs are similar, then we get a quadratic speed up here. All right. Simon? Yeah? This is classical hitting time that you're talking about, right? Uh, no, no, so now, now uh, okay, yes, yes, yes. Square root of so, classical hitting time. Yes, exactly. So, no. so HT is always the, the classical hitting time, um, but this would be the cost of a quantum algorithm um, uh, which would detect this markdown. But yes, thank you. Okay, so this was Sagadino Ford, and there was uh, Manyes 
Naya Kolar and Samta in 06, who proved under the same constraint that if sigma equals pi, then you can actually find a marked element. So we can find some marked element in a cost which is the following s plus one over square root epsilon delta u plus one over square root epsilon c. Now this thing compares to the um, classical cost of the mixing time algorithm, right? Where we're basically getting square roots over these two quantities. Uh, whereas this one compares to the classical hitting time algorithm. So these two, just like in a classical case, are kind of incomparable. Uh, but we get here that, that at least they find a marked element, right? They don't just detect it. But this line of started by Segedi uh, was further improved. First by uh, Crovey, Manias, Ozols, and Roland in, in, in uh, 2010, who showed that under the same constraint that sigma is equals pi and an additional constraint that there's only a single marked element, then they show how to find this marked element. So then we can find this marked element in cost s plus square root hitting time u plus c, right? So basically at the same cost of Zegarty's algorithm, um, but under the additional constraint, there's only a single marked element, then they show how to find this marked element, getting the same quadratic speed up. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll also um, just mention that I'm gonna omit log factors throughout this talk, right? Uh, this is, um, I'm also gonna be clear about that. This is also in our, um, advantage, like we get some extra log factors with respect to former algorithms, um, but you know, for the, for clarity, I'm going to omit these log factors. All right, so we have this uh, Crowley, Manias, Ozols, and Roland in 10. The next thing is uh, Belofs in 13, who used, like I mentioned before, this sort of electric networks connection. And so what he showed is that basically something for any initial distribution. He, sh he showed that we, we can actually um, prove something without this, um, uh, this constraint on sigma. He showed that for any sigma, we can detect, right? So that's kind of the, the downside. We can detect whether there exists a marked element or not in a time which is S plus square root RM U plus C. Now this is a new quantity, right? The R, um, is the effective resistance between this initial distribution sigma and m. Um, and so I'm not gonna define this exactly, uh, but I'll note for instance that um, this thing equals the hitting time from sigma to m if, um, if sigma equals pi. So he basically recovers a uh, second result, but it equals the commute time if uh, sigma equals some initial, uh, a single node. So if you start from a single node, then this quantity equals the commute time and the commute time is basically the expected time to go from this node to M and back to the node, okay? So it's at least the hitting time. Um, but okay, so that's what, what he proved. What is M, Simon? M is, uh, okay, so I was talking about this entire quantity here. And so R is the effect resistance and M is the number of edges in the graph. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm again assuming that the graph is unweighted. Otherwise, this would be like capital W, basically the total weight of the edges. Okay. So then we have uh, another paper can, by... Can I ask a question, Simon? So you, you talked about the return time of coming from a yes. thing to M. They also used M, I think. Yes. That's Wait, different. What's the question? So the, what is the return time again? Okay, so um, classically you, you wanna start from some node S and you wanna hit M and then you're done. It seems that quantumly you have to look at a, a slightly more um, um, complicated quantity. You have to go from S to M and back to S and you can get a quadratic speed up on that. Okay, and M here is the, the set of marked elements. Oh no, sorry. So, so this is small M. Um, okay, yeah, that's, maybe that's a bit bad notation. This is basically uh, the number of edges in the graph. So this combined quantity equals the hitting time if sigma is pi and equals the commute time if sigma is a single node. And but in the commute time, the, the M you used is, is, is the set of marked elements. Yes, yes, exactly. That, that, that was my question because you okay. used M twice. So, sorry. Yes, I sure. Yep. Okay, perfect. 
All right, so then we go to 2017. There was Dohotaru and Hoyer who proved that, um, again, going, getting back this constraint, if sigma is pi, and there's only a single marked element, then we can actually um, uh, find, find this marked element in um, cost S plus square root of the hitting time, U plus one over square root epsilon C. And so this is a bit of an odd duck in here because let me show you, it's, it's, it's basically better than all the things that we had before under these constraints, right? Because this is smaller than S plus square root hitting time U plus C, right? Because one over square root epsilon is at most square root hitting time. And it's also smaller or equal to the MNRS uh, speed up. Square root epsilon delta U plus uh, one over square root epsilon C which basically follows from the two inequalities that I proved before. Um, and, so, and so this is kind of an, an, a very nice result, which I think was, was somewhat um, missed in the literature, to my, at least to my impression. Um, but this is only um, uh, under these specific constraints, all right? And then finally, there was uh, the work by Ambaini, Skillian, Jeffrey, and Kokainis in 19, who basically kind of finished this line started by SEGD04, KMOR in 10. Then they basically proved that under the, still under this constraint that sigma is equal to pi, you can actually find a marked element irrespective of the number of marked elements, right? So they basically drop like, here in this KMOR result, there was this constraint that you only uh, could have a single marked element. They, they get rid of this constraint. You can actually find a marked element in S plus square root hitting time, U plus C. Okay. So I can summarize these different uh, results in this picture um, where we have, like I said, Segedi, and then there's these sort of improvements on, 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 on his results. Um, and then there's like a bunch of them that ask that you start from a stationary and there's only Balov's result who shows you know, start from an arbitrary distribution. Can I ask a question? Yes. And uh, maybe also because uh, Marius is in the audience. Um, to, w why is it uh, uh, um, not uh, immediate that if you have an element, uh, if you have an algorithm that can find the mark element under the assumption that there is a unique one, mm -hmm then you can uh, employ that algorithm also uh, for a situation where there are many marked elements by doing something that's called isolation where you um, you somehow um, re remove marked elements um, at okay. random with, with a certain probability. Yes. In such a case that only a single one uh, remains with reasonable probability. Yes, so, so, so that's a very good question. Um, and and um, the answer is that um, you can do that but then the hitting time is going to go up, right? You can imagine that you have some initial node where you start from, and then you have a very large set of marked elements. It's going to be much easier to hit this large set than if there's only a single marked element. And so you can kind of eliminate a lot of marked elements, but then you're going to make the problem more, more difficult. But when you have like a few marked elements, that would also work. Uh, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, if, it, if, uh, if, you, if you have a couple of one, you could maybe do some hashing and then exactly, you know, you yeah. get the good one with high probability. Yes, I agree. Thanks. All right. So we have this, this kind of um, hobbly picture here. Um, and what we do is we, we, we basically kind of put all of these things together um, and improve on, on, on a couple of fronts. So what we prove is that for any initial distribution sigma, we can find a marked element in time S plus square root R tau M. And so this is to be compared with this thing here, square root RM and R tau is like, we introduce new parameter tau times square root tau U plus C. So this quantity is a little is, is a little complicated. So basically, this are introducing a new parameter tau, 
uh, which, which, which you can think of as, as a, basically the number of steps that you do between checks. Um, but this new quantity uh, allows us basically to repro re reproduce all of the existing results here, right? So, so uh, what was tau? So is a free parameter and you can interpret it. It's, a, it's a, um, an integer, a non-negative in integer. And you can interpret it as the number of walk steps you would do between checks. So is that the tau somehow lets you interpolate between this heating time and the mixing time algorithm? Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. So this will allow us basically to interpolate between these different frameworks. So I'm just going to demonstrate how we reproduce these existing results here. Uh, so basically we get one here. If we set um, tau equals one and sigma equal pi, we get two if we set tau equal to one over delta, right? So recall in this mixing time algorithm, just like Marius just mentioned, um, we would basically set this tau equal to one over delta. Um, so yeah, one question, so wasn't RM the commute time as opposed to the heating time? Or you are viewing them as the same roughly? Um, so, yes, so, so, but that's a good point. Um, in the case where um, uh, sigma equals pi, you basically get that the commute time um, will be equal to the hitting time. Um, okay, but I'm going to give a bit more um, intuition of, about, about this quantity in the next slide. Um, so then three, we get... Um, uh, by setting tau, let me see. Um, so basically, if sigma equals, oh, we get three if we set tau equal to epsilon hitting time, sigma equal to pi, and if there's a single marked element. Then we reproduce this result by Dorotaro and Hoyer. And then finally, we re re reproduce Balov's result and strengthen it because we also find in this framework um, by setting tau equal to one. Right. So this kind of also demonstrates how, how Balov's result is a special case of this result. Sorry, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I was wondering, so in a classical case, in the very beginning, you were talking about this mixing time and heating time. Is it actually known what's the best classical algorithm? Because you, were, you, you said at the beginning that these mixing time and heating time algorithms, they are not comparable in a classical case. And like, is it known what the best algorithm is? And is your algorithm like a quantization of some sense of that algorithm? Or? Uh, so what you can do is you can, and that's basically what, 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 what we also do, you can kind of interpolate between these two parameters, right. or between these two um, um, algorithms. But I, I mean, they're fundamentally incomparable, right? Um, I think one exception is, uh, which is basically also proved by Dorotaru and Hoyer, is if there's a single marked element, then you can kind of get the best of both worlds. And I think that, 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 that under certain constraints, this would be optimal, right? So, so they prove it with square roots, but you can also um, get the same result without the square roots for classical walks. But if there's many marked elements, then it really depends on, on how the costs compare, I think. But so, so okay, but I guess you're saying that it's not clear what, what what the optimal algorithm is classically, basically. No, it, it would depend on, on the uh, relative costs of U and C, for instance. Okay. But it's not even clear that it lies in a certain family that's like parametrized by like a tau or something like that. Uh, arguably, arguably, I think you could say that, but, but, but no. Okay. Probably be difficult to make that. Uh... Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right. So um, to give some intuition about this quantity, um, so in a special case where sigma equals pi, we get this quantity actually equals the hitting time, uh, but not just the hitting time of p, but it equals the hitting time of p to the tau, right? And so how do we interpret this quantity? Again, if you have some x0, if we take tau steps, we get x1, tau steps, and so on. And then in the end, we wait until we um, find a marked element, then the number of steps that we have to take here is basically the hitting time of p to the tau. So we get this kind of interpretation by seeing p to the tau as a new random walk in some sense. Right, so you can plot out this quantity and then you see that if tau is just one, we get the, the uh, normal hitting time. And so what we get here is basically the result of Ambani, Scalian, Jeffrey, 
and cocaine from 90. If tau is very large, like one over delta, then we get that the hitting time is kind of optimal in some sense, it's one over epsilon. Um, and so then here we get this result by MNRS uh, from O6, I think. Um, and then in between, there's this sort of, like I said, all duck by Dortauer and Hoyer. Um, but again, this only works um, for the case where there's a single marked element. And this green line, this is basically what, what we have. Right? We have this sort of continuous interpolation between, um, between uh, all of these uh, frameworks. All right. A second illustration, uh, in case where tau is one, we get that r tau equals r. And so basically we get this, this sort of commute time quantity, um, which, which Balofs introduced. So, okay, but I've introduced it in, in the quantum realm, right? This is it's a very well known and studied uh, concept classically. So to recall what Balofs proved is, you, is that you can, sorry, you can detect a marked element in S plus square root R M U plus C um, for any sigma. Right, and what we what what we get is we get the same thing, right? So we get an algorithm which works for any sigma has the same cost, but we also find a marked element, right? And this particular result, which is like one one, one of the uh, different things that we proved, was proven independently by um, Stephen Piddock in nineteen. Um, but it's kind of interesting um, the both uh, both approaches. Like we really use a combinatorial approach, trying to relate this quantity to commute times. Whereas Piddock really used um, electric, um, electric reasoning, electric networks. So again, to illustrate, uh, but I've al already uh, mentioned this, like in a special case where um, sigma corresponds to an initial node, a single node S, uh, then we get that Rm equals the commute time from S to M. Okay, I'll just show how that works, starting from S, we, we basically take a walk and, and we wait until we visit M at some point. And then we, 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 we wait another time until uh, we basically get back to S, right? So that's why we call it a commute, right? You have to go to M and back to S. And so we get a speed up on this quantity, but notice that, and this is kind of an interesting um, um, contrast with the case where sigma equals pi, is that this commute time can be much larger than the hitting time but we can only get a quadratic speed up on the commute time. So that shows that if even this quadratic speed up doesn't make the commute time smaller than the hitting time, then we don't get a quantum speed up. And it seems that this is sort of intrinsic, that this, this is really a situation um, where we really cannot find a quantum speed up. Sorry, but is the commute time is with respect to a certain initial vertex, right? The hitting time is starting yes. from the uniform distribution. So starting from S, yes. Simon, with no quantum speed up, you mean for these algorithms or absolutely impossible? Well, I mean, basically you can imagine the following, the following situation um, where um, like you have some initial node S and let's say you have a marked element here. And, you know, we move, uh, we have like a, a Markov chain, which goes like that way with very large probability, like one minus epsilon, but this, okay, this is different epsilon and moves back with probability epsilon. Um, then you get that you're gonna get here basically in let's say three steps and you cannot, you cannot improve on that, right? You kind of get a sort of, this is basically the number of steps that you need to make to get to M. Um, it seems that we can only get a quantum speed up in the case where uh, we kind of have some like, like where the, the random walk is, you know, being a bit lazy, a bit lagging. Um, and, and you don't get it in this case. And, 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 and here you get that, the, that the, the commute time would be much larger, right? Getting back to S would be difficult. And we could get a quantum speed up on that, but not on the hitting time. Thanks. All right. Okay, good. Um, so let's see what I have next. So, okay, we have, we have um, um, like just give you a taste, like some additional results that we get. We also show that in the case where um, tau is one, so this is like one part of you know, the sort of interpolation that we have, 
we only need quantum walks, right? So formal results build on phase estimation um, or quantum fast forwarding. And we also use quantum fast forwarding for our general algorithm, but we show that we don't need it uh, in this specific case. So we just need to implement quantum walks. This answer is an open question from um, um, this earlier paper by Ambanis, Gillian, Jeffrey, and Kokanis from 19. And then we also prove sort of, a, uh, uh, which is another window of, of the results, we, we prove a speed up on uh, Monte Carlo hitting times. Right, like the hitting times that we defined, the expected number of steps, so basically a Las Vegas hitting times, you can also define Monte Carlo hitting times. And it's kind of a variant on that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm, I'm gonna give a bit of a, like, like some technical um, um, results that we have, like just to give a bit of the taste, like, like how we did things. Uh, but I think it would be a good point to maybe, like if there's any more questions on the results at this point, I have some general questions about the model. Mm -hmm. um, two things in the first place. If you are having such a simple graph, uh, if you are at node, there is basically no way to discriminate between the outgoing edges there. Yes. So is there any alternative then doing some kind of uniform distribution, either in your classical random process or yes. some uniform state if you're a quantum. Yes, um, so you can prove that, um, like, the, like for instance, what you can do is you can um, increase the probability of going to nodes with say lower degree, um, because these nodes would often be more difficult to visit. And so you can kind of make the, the, the random walk spread out better by, by kind of picking these sort of less fortunate nodes. You uh, have actually... assumed that the graph was regular, so that doesn't help. Okay, so if it's regular, I mean, like, like you can do things like there's, there's, re there's results on non-backtracking walks, where basically, you know, you just never pick the neighbor where you, come, where you came from. Um, and you can, you can kind of prove like, very small speed ups uh, using these strategies. But other than that, I think you can um, probably prove that, that in certain cases, I mean, there's really no, no sort of better way to explore a graph. You know? Okay, the second question about the model was about detection or finding eventually. Mm -hmm. If you have a superposition of states basically, uh, then you suggest it by flipping the phase of the mm -hmm. marked nodes, um, you can update that state, but um, in order to know whether that has had any effect, you will have to do some kind of measurement, which will then collapse the state. So how in a quantum walk do you actually observe the fact that you have succeeded? Okay. Um, so that's a good question. I mean, the phase flipping is kind of um, similar to how Grover works. So Grover does a reflection around the uniform superposition, and then does a, this basically this phase oracle applies this reflection around the marked states. Um, and quantum walks, you can see them as a sort of delocalized way of, uh, like that's exactly how uh, this MNRS result works. They basically use a quantum walk to implement the reflection around the stationary state. Um, but 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 the, the second part of your question um, about you know how do you know that your quantum walk has um, you know hit the set M? There's not really a very good answer to that. Um, basically, you have to ensure that your quantum walk you know that you get a lower bound on 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 the time, so that after this time the quantum walk kind of is in the marked set with a large probability. So this is but, but so this is a very subtle issue. What we have well, to basically you for. do do not observe before the end of the run. No, and exactly. Then you exactly. have a probability of that the collapsed state indeed is exactly if you want exactly. to have it. Yes, exactly. So that's an important difference with classical walks. Like classical walks just need to move through the mark set, you know, one time and we'll see it. Quantum walks have to kind of stay around the mark nodes and, 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 and that's kind of an, an you know non trivial issue. Good, thanks. All right, good. So, so then I'm gonna give uh, like two sort of technical um, ideas uh, that we use. Like one, I'm, I'm gonna sketch how, how we basically um, 
prove this one result where we um, set tau equal to one and we find in square root RM quantum walk steps. So what's the idea here? The idea is uh, first we build on a technique called quantum fast forwarding, which is from a former paper of mine with Alain Charlet, which uh, basically describes how to map some initial state, let's say sigma, with an extra uh, empty register to the state PT uh, sigma zero plus some orthogonal register here. Now notice that this is uh, the random walk operator, right? Uh, so this is a classical operator. So it's kind of interesting that here we get a quantum state, but we're, we're applying, we're able to apply a classical operator on this quantum state. And that's interesting, but it's also um, problematic for many reasons, but you know, in a lot of cases, this, this, this actually gives a very interesting um, object. And not only can we do that, uh, we can actually do that in O square root T quantum walk steps. So let me put a tilde here just to be clear. Um, so whereas classical walk would, you know, in some sense take T steps to implement this operator, a quantum walk can do it in square root T steps, right? So this is one technique. Then we use a, uh, a lemma, which basically says that this quantity that, you know, that we were just looking at this P to the power T on Sigma, this will have a large overlap with M. So this is the projection on M, right? This basically corresponds to the probability of measuring M uh, of, of finding a marked element if we measure this state. Will be constant. So, so we, we will find const, with constant probability um, a marked element if the random walk, so the classical random walk, commutes between sigma and M in OT steps, right? So here we're basically using, uh, we're not using any electric quantities here. We're using um, classical combinatorial quantities, right? So we can prove that if the random walk commutes, so basically if the random walk goes from some node in sigma, goes up to M and gets back in um, OT steps, then it suffices to basically implement this operator with a T here. Uh, to find a marked element with constant probability. So I'm cheating a little bit here. Like basically this guy has to be an interpolated walk, which, which is, is a way of dealing with this issue that I mentioned about having to stay at marked elements and things like that, which is a technique from um, KMOR in 10. Uh, and we're using, um, uh, we're kind of um, 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 pushing a lemma from, from, uh, from this uh, Ambanis et al. paper a bit further. Simon, what is pi m? Is that the projector on the marked state? Yes, exactly. So this, this, this full quantity um, uh, denotes the probability of finding a marked element if you would measure this component of a quantum state. I see. All right, so as a corollary, this gives us uh, that we can find a marked element in O tilde square root of the um, sigma m commute time. All right. In that many quantum walk steps. So that's, okay, that's one thing. Um, but we weren't quite satisfied with, with that because we wanted to you know, reproduce these results by Belofs. Uh, and he didn't use this commute time, he used this, um, this electric quantity. But like I already mentioned, um, there's like a, a connection between these things, right? Um, in a special case where sigma is a single node or sigma equals pi, there's these two quantities, Michael. sorry? There's a question from Michael. Um, he asks if P of T on zero state is subnormalized state that has probabilities as amplitudes. It's a subnormalized state that has, um, that has, yes, exactly. It has exactly the probabilities as amplitudes, yes. Um, so there's a lot of issues with, you know, um, if something would work in the classical, um, uh, on, on if, if it would be a classical state, then it might not work if the object is a quantum state because we're comparing L1 and L2 norms here. Um, so this is kind of a non-trivial thing, but, but you can work things out and it kind of uh, turn out well. Does it have the probabilities or the, the square roots of the probabilities as amplitudes? The probabilities. But I think sigma has square roots, no? Can you go yes. back so yeah. sigma has square roots, but let's just think about sigma as being, you know, localized on a single node. Then P is really the random walk operator. So in that sense, um, you really get like this thing here would be the random walk probability distribution. 
I agree if sigma is a more general state, then, then, then you get the square roots here. But then it's not even clear what it is because you apply the random walk on something that's not a probability distribution. It's no, but, 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 but if sigma is a single node, then it is clear. Yeah, no, then, it's, then it's clear. Yeah, I agree. Um, and so, so, so we knew that this connection was existing for um, uh, when, when sigma is a single node or sigma is the uniform distribution, but we kind of extend this connection um, and I mean, it's, it's not, the connection is not as clean and not as clear as, you know, these special cases, but we can kind of, you know, get this connection like good enough, right? So basically what we're connecting here is a combinatorial quantity um, with this um, electric quantity here. All right. So what we get as a corollary of that is that we can actually find a marked element in O tilde square root of Rm, right? Quantum walk steps. Uh, and that's basically our improvement over this um, results by Bellows. Okay, then as last thing, um, so, so, so do I still have five minutes? Yes, I'm in. Okay, perfect. That, that, should, be, that should be enough. So the last thing I want to show, like, so I showed in the, in, in the, in the former, you know, star, in, like in this part, how we can use this quantum fast forwarding technique to like, implement the classical walk operator and then use classical arguments to, to argue about the quantum walk. I'm going to show how we can avoid this QFF, this quantum fast forwarding, right? So to reiterate, our um, quantum walk algorithm does the following, starts from the sigma zero state, it applies this uh, quantum fast forwarding scheme, and we basically get the following object now, p to the t sigma zero, plus again, some orthogonal state. Um, and this here corresponds to sort of a, and we can interpret it as a bit of a classical quantity. Um, and then it suffices to just do the following thing. Now we just measure the first register, right? So this corresponds to like, this is a, a quantum state, this component is a quantum state over the node set, we just measure that and we should get with high probability or with constant probability a marked element, okay? This is kind of kind of how, how this uh, quantum walk algorithm works. But if we now pry open this, this, this QFF box, um, we can try and avoid this QFF thing. Uh, basically, what this QFF um, routine looks like, it's, it's basically an LCU thing. It's a linear combination of unitaries. So what we first do is we uh, first create, uh, we put this extra register in superposition, square root alpha sigma L, right? And this will be sort of a, a sort of time register here where, where L goes from zero to square root T. And, and these are um, alpha L, so um, sum to one. So this is like a good quantum state, right? So basically we're just putting the second register in superposition uh, the quantum state square root alpha. Then conditioned on this last register, we apply uh, the walk operator, L times if, if the register has um, L in there, right? So we get the same um, sum here, we get square root alpha L and then W L sigma L, right? So, so far this is the unitary quantum walk operator. So we don't get any garbage in, in here. It's just like a controlled operator. And then finally, we kind of map this back, this state back, and then uh, we will get some garbage, right? What we get is, um, we get an alpha L here, W L sigma, and now we just get a zero register here, plus some garbage, okay? And this thing right here, oh, this entire sum here, this is basically um, equal to p to the power t on sigma, okay? So these alpha l's, I'm not gonna specify them, they're kind of related to uh, Chebyshev um, expansion of this operator, uh, but it's not important to, to, to know what exactly these are. Good, so then we have this state, like I showed in the previous slide, and then we just measure the first register and find the marked element with constant probability. But now we wanna get rid of, you know, this, this sort of machinery. So what we note first is that if you look carefully, like this operator here only works on the second register, right? And here we only measure the first register. So these things commute. 
So what we can do instead is we can kind of, so let's see if I can do that. I'll just move that here for a second. We can commute these two, right? We can put this one at the end and like do a measurement before. But since we only care about this thing, we can now forget about this entire stuff here, right? Because this is just something that works on a second register, but we, we don't care about that register. We just care about the first register. And here we should have already found a marked element. Okay, so I'm deleting that. So now we get this new kind of scheme. All right. Now, um, here again, we, we're just measuring the first register. So what I'm gonna do here, and, and this kind of, you know, this might come out of the blue, but ultimately it should make sense. What we can do here is we can measure the second register, right? Because this measurement, we can see it as an operation on the second register. So again, this would, like, let's say that we would do it afterwards. Um, that wouldn't make any difference. And it would commute with this operator because they work on different registers. Um, so we might as well measure in like at, at this point. But if we measure this guy, if we measure the second register, we're gonna get register L with probability alpha L, right? The square of this thing. So this yields, so if we get L, we basically get the state W to power L sigma. with probability alpha L, right? And then we just measure this state. And that's the same thing, like the, the outcome that we should get will be the same statistics as the original algorithm. And so what does this imply? This implies that what we need to measure is just this thing. But this thing is just a quantum walk on the initial state. Where, where the number of steps is chosen randomly, but apart from that, it's just a quantum walk. So this proves that the following algorithm is equivalent. At least it's equivalent in, 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 in the way that it's gonna generate an output node. We can pick um, some L between zero and square root T with probability alpha L, where again, these alpha Ls are, are kind of, you know, known parameters that do not depend on the, on the, on the problem instance. We apply L quantum walk steps on the initial state. And then we just measure that state. And that should yield with constant probability a marked element. So this thing here is basically a replacement for the more complicated quantum fast forwarding and amplitude amplification algorithm and so on. And we just need to apply this quantum walk operator. Okay, so, so this was my last slide. Um, thanks for uh, listening. I hope things were kind of clear. Um, and I'm very open to any questions whatsoever.